some travel stories from the New York Post. And uh, I'd been there for about two weeks, traveling down through Patagonia, and uh, with a group of journalists uh, on a press trip. That's where they, they take you around and show you the country. And uh, it was our final night, and I was sitting in a bar with uh, this guy named Julian Smith. He was sort of my hero on this trip because he was writing for uh, National Geographic and he had written for the Times and Outside Magazine. Uh, <laughs> and I was writing for the New York Post. So it was like, you know, travel royalty with this guy. So I was always kind of trying to take a peek at his notes and kind of get, uh, get the insight about what he was thinking about this trip. And so finally I just, you know, had the nerve to say, Julian, you know, what, what's the story that you see here? And it's like I, 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 I set him off on a rant. It's like, there's, there's no story here. I mean, Nate, we're, we're being sort of shuffled around by our, our, you know, these people who are taking care of us and we're going from four-star hotel to golf course to winery to, uh, you know, all these fancy places. He goes, we're not seeing the real Argentina. There's no story here. Our handlers don't even let us out of their sight. It's ridiculous. He was quite upset here. But I was listening to him, National Geographic and all, and he goes, you know what, Nate? Let's go out the back door of this bar, let's ditch our handlers, and let's spend one night and see what's going on in Argentina. I was like, National Geographic, this is how it works. <laughs> I'm out the back door, and uh, we kind of like trek around. This is a really small mountain town. There must only be a thousand, two thousand people in this town. and uh, we go into this bar, we kind of found this little downtown area, go into this bar, start having these great conversations with locals, people we hadn't been able to talk to. They're telling us all the great places to go, what's, what's great to see, what's really going on there. We're having such a good time, they say, oh, you've got to go to this, this other bar, there's a lot of great people down there, about a mile down the road. So we're going down the road, this sort of city street, and we're, uh, Julian says, I, I've got to piss. And we've, up and over this, like, climbing this 10-foot brick wall, because we're on a city street, kind of this town street, and up and over, and I'm like, wow, you know, again, this must be what the National Geographic people do. And I'm like, let's go over. So I'm over, and we're pissing, and then we're sitting there, and we're looking out. Uh, we're in this sort of, even though we're in the mountains, it's like a shipyard. These, these expensive sailboats are up on stilts, and I can see fog kind of rolling in, mountain fog, and I see these little lights in the distance, and they're bouncing around, and they're coming closer, and then I can see their flashlights, and then I can see it's like a ragtag bunch of security guards, and we're up, and before we could go, Julian's like, ah, oh, I can't get out, just, just play dumb, we're just American dumb tourists, we got lost, it's okay. Well, they come and they start shouting at us, at us in Spanish, and I don't, high school Spanish is about the most I speak, and Julian the same thing, so we're like, sorry, we, we got a little lost, we're leaving, no problem, I'm sorry. And they're talking on the radios, and then they say, down in the dirt, and we're like, okay, it's all right, you know, we'll, we'll get down. And they have their boots in our back, and they're holding us down. And, uh, and then Julian just starts, he, he really kind of ramps up the talking. He's like, listen, we're, we, we don't know what we're doing, we're just here. And then finally he's like, listen, we, we're just, we're journalists. We're just here writing little puff pieces, little articles on things. And right when he said journalist, that's when the guy who was at my back uh, reached down and took out his pistol and placed it on my head. Uh, Julian saw this and got quiet uh, immediately. We were both very quiet. And they say in those moments that uh, that time slows down. But what happened for me, it didn't slow down, it actually, there was this feeling of acceleration. I started to kind of feel this movement as they were talking on the radios and adjusting my handcuffs in my back. And we hadn't put up any fight, and yet there's a pistol at my head. And all I could think is, let's, can we, let's, let's slow down, please. Because I feel with this movement that any little finger movement could mean the end of my life. And so we're quiet, they're talking on the radios. Next thing you know, they have us up, and we're in the back of this van. Julian is playing cool. He's like, 
don't worry, man. They're just trying to scare us. You know, it'll all be over soon. Once they figure out who we are, it, it's totally cool. We get vans to this police station. It's a, a shack. I mean, it's out of a movie. There's three, four police officers there in the shack with miscellaneous uh, parts of outfits on that don't match. <laughs> and nothing seems to be going on. It's probably about midnight or 1 a.m. and we're placed against the wall. And we stay at that wall for about two to three hours. Uh, we don't get any phone calls. Uh, we're not given very much information. And there's this sort of good cop, bad cop thing going on. There's this sort of like 16 year old kind of smiley kid who's a cop. And then there's this kind of grizzled old guy who keeps coming in and sort of saying, where are your passports? And we, we didn't have our passports with us. They were back at the hotel. And they're like, what, journalists, what are you doing here? Where, where are you? And we we're trying to say where the hotel was, but the hotel was new. That's why we were covering it. So it wasn't in this old phone book he was looking in. Our story was getting worse and worse. And he was getting more and more angry. And we were sitting there and we're like, listen, honestly, we're, we just need to go. At this point, we've been standing there three, four hours. Julian has actually, I hate to say, urinated in his pants because we'd been drinking, we weren't allowed to go anywhere. And we were handcuffed uh, against this wall. And finally, after a few phone calls, uh, the bad cop came up and said, no passport, trespassing, writing stories, journalist. And then he looks up and he goes, medical examination. And we're like, what? <laughs> we are put into the back of a van, face down on the metal, with only two officers, and we drive out of town along a dirt road. And we know because we had been traveling around, there are no hospitals, there are no towns. We're being driven for about 40 minutes down the road, and I start to think, as I'm lying face down, about why we were in Argentina writing puff pieces. <laughs> we were brought down there to drum up tourism, because tourism was at a low. Because during the 70s and the 80s, there was something going on down there called the Dirty War. And in this war, what was happening were uh, teachers, uh, thinkers, citizens, uh, journalists were being, uh, it was called disappeared. Uh, Sting wrote a song about this. Uh, in fact, he, he had written a song about the, the mothers of the disappeared who danced with the photographs of their husbands and their uh, children who had disappeared. And we had seen those, those mothers still dancing in the square. And I started, and so we were there to drum up tourism because that was a long time ago and that didn't happen. And as I was sitting there, I was remembering this image in a book that I had read where they said they would put the journalists and they would put the uh, teachers uh, they would arrest them, put them on a plane, fly at 10,000 feet over the ocean, and just drop them out. And as we're being driven in this van into the mountain wilderness for a medical examination, I'm thinking, and then I say to Julian, I don't think we're getting a medical examination. And for the first time ever, he looks at me and says, I think you're right. And the van comes to a halt and we are taken out, and uh, there's this concrete building that's abandoned, some broken lights, and we were told to go uh, down the hallway, and uh, it was dark, uh, somewhat lit, and um, I remember Julian, our hands were cuffed behind our backs, and uh, he kind of reached out to try to grab my hand, and he said, let's try not to be separated. Um, So we were brought into this room, and, uh, and this guy came to look at us, and he kind of looked at our head for some wounds, and uh, talked to us in Spanish, and again, I was wishing that I had paid more attention in high school. I didn't understand what he was saying. And then he took out this long document for us to sign, and he made it very clear that we will sign this document, and it felt very clear to me what this document was some sort of confession 
that uh, we would sign and, uh, and give them some excuse to uh, disappear us. And uh, after about an hour, uh, it was just clear that we had to sign it. So we signed this document and uh, then there were some phone calls back and forth uh, with the, uh, the people who were uh, in the room. And uh, we were put back into the van, back down the dirt road. And uh, when the doors opened to the van, we were back at the police station that we had started at. And there was that grizzled cop right there. And he was looking at us and we were brought in and he took off the handcuffs and he said, you can go. And we're thinking to ourselves, let's go now. <laughs> what we saw to our right were our two handlers with our passports. This grizzled cop looks at us with that look and we get into the back seat of the car with our handlers and it's quiet in the car and our handlers kind of joking and laughing. They're like, <laughs> sounds like you had a great night, huh? And we're like, what? And he goes, yeah, they told us they picked you up, you were drunk and belligerent, they just threw you in the drunk tank for a bit. <laughs> and Julian and I just looked at each other quietly and he winked, that knowing wink where he says, now we have a story. Wow. Thank you.